Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this drizzly Sunday morning, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, for those keeping track. Welcome to worship. Friends, as we gather to worship, we acknowledge that the land upon which our community serve and worship is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, on land covered by Treaty Number 29, also known as the Huron Track Purchase of 1827. We give thanks for the opportunity to live and serve on this land with all its peoples. We acknowledge where relations have gone awry, and we continue to apologize and live out that apology in listening and in action, both as a church and as individuals. And as we prepare ourselves for worship, we take a moment to uplift that identity that brings us all together here today, that identity of being siblings in Christ. In that spirit, we light our Christ candle. We celebrate God in our midst as loving parent, devoted son, and imminent spirit, a relationship ever sure and ever new. And we light our other candles as candles of care, remembering those in our congregation, in our community, and around the world who are especially on our hearts at this time. Today in particular, we keep in our prayers the people of Morocco and Libya as they face rebuilding and... Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, as they face rebuilding and re-engaging as communities. <coughs> Friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. Take a moment, give a wave, give a peace sign, however you want to greet one another this morning. And let's join together in our call to worship. Join in worship those who need a word of forgiveness. For you will find it here in God's word. Join in worship those who need an embrace of healing, for you will find it here in the Spirit's embrace. Join in worship those who dare to seek right relations, for you will find it here in our relationships through Christ. Let us worship the Lord to whom we belong, the Lord of mercy and love. Hallelujah. Oh, that wasn't nearly loud enough, folks. In our hearts, may we find comfort and strength. 
In our wrongs, may we find compassion and the desire to change. In our actions, may we use your mercy and care on others. And instill these things in our worship today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go right to our scripture readings for this week. And our scripture readings are a continuation of last week, both the letter to the Romans from Paul and the Gospel of Matthew. We'll start with the letter to the Romans. Uh, as I mentioned last week, the letter to the Romans can be kind of split up into two parts based on the greatest commandment. Love God and love your neighbor. The first part of the uh, letter to the Romans talks about how we are to love God and how God loves us. And now we're in the part of the letter where Paul is uh, teaching about how we are to love others. This particular passage from chapter 14, uh, it has to deal specifically with some of the uh, dietary and purity concerns that were facing the congregation in Rome at the time. You had Jewish Christians, you had Gentile Christians, the Jewish Christians still had their purity uh, rituals and uh, dietary restrictions. So they were trying to figure out, okay, how are we supposed to be together? And Paul, to answer that, reminds us of our greater identity as belonging to the Lord. And that's the identity that we focus on with one another. It's the identity we focus on when there's tensions, when there's disagreements, but also in times of celebration and joy as well. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So that each of us will be accountable to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 103, and this is a psalm that reminds us of God's forgiveness and mercy and compassion. So you can follow along on the screen here or in Voices United, number 825. Glenn will play the refrain once, I'll sing it once, and then we'll all sing it together and go ahead with the reading. Those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, 
so far have you put away our sins from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you. As a mother comforts her child, so you comfort us, O oh God. For you know how we were made. You remember that we are dust. Bless God, O oh my soul.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. What do you think is the hardest word to say in the English language? Any guesses? Supercalifragilistic expialidocious. Supercalifragilistic expialidocious. Da 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 da. That's a good one. Uh, how about deoxyguanosine monophosphate? It's not a fancy word. <laughs> That's one of the four types of nucleotides in DNA. That's Great eleven biology for you. Uh, how about sesquipedalianism? Anyone want to guess what that means? That is a word for someone who likes to use big fancy words. <laughs> sesquipedalianism. There we go. But in fact, I think the hardest word to say in the English language is sorry. It was right there. For us. <laughs> And as Canadians, you might challenge me on that fact. In fact, we say sorry so much that there's a literal apology act in our provincial law code so that saying sorry isn't used as an admission of guilt because we say sorry so much just to express our sympathy or our care to someone. Yet I think saying sorry and really meaning it can really get us tongue-tied sometimes. And the other phrase that's nearly impossible to say I forgive you. Sometimes it feels like our mouth can never quite get the right shape to get these phrases out. So let's start with sorry, because that tends to be the first word that needs to be said in the context of forgiveness. Whenever I think of Peter asking Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive? I picture him as some little kid with a scrunched up face being asked to apologize to their sibling after they broke their toy or hit them with a shovel or something, or... That's... To be fair, she hit me... No, I hit her with the golf club, she hit me with the shovel, so that's... <laughs> Saying sorry can just be difficult for us. We're human. It's going to be difficult. But we are prompted to apologize because we have been living or acting in ways that are apart from God's love and the love that God calls us to offer one another. To note the strain in this divine relationship with the sorry brings that tension to the surface, which makes us feel uncomfortable or guilty or afraid. And so, yes, we don't really want to acknowledge that or to say sorry. And in a society that values individualism and retribution, that also has us afraid to say sorry because we don't want to risk ourselves getting cut off from what ties we do have with others. Or we have fear that others will respond in kind. But in the ministry and the grace that is found in Christ, we find that sorry and forgiveness takes on a different meaning, has a different emphasis. In his teaching, and his parable, Jesus points out that saying sorry to God isn't met with some quantifiable limit or a means of punishment, but rather it's met with divine grace and compassion. Seventy times, seven times. Ten thousand talents, or however many it was, enough money to pay someone's salary for thousands of years. Jesus is using these ridiculous numbers to show that saying sorry to God and saying sorry in the name of God to one another and meaning it can be met with pure love and pure transformation of our hearts. God doesn't just expect us to muster the courage and reasons to say sorry on our own. God accompanies us on this journey to forgiveness helping us recognize both where we need to be held accountable and where we can be met with grace and acceptance. Jesus accompanies the disciples on this journey when they need forgiveness. Paul accompanies the congregation in Rome needing forgiveness with his long-winded letter. God prompts them and us to seek reconciliation, to say sorry, 
in full faith and with the assurance of God's loving presence. The American Mennonite scholar and founder for the Center of Justice and Peace Building, a man by the name of Jean Paul Lederach, speaks of this accompaniment from God in his five qualities of practice in reconciliation. And he talks about this accompaniment using another biblical narrative, one that's familiar to us, the story of Jacob and Esau. You remember that one where Isaac doesn't have good eyesight, he blesses Jacob even though Esau is the one who's supposed to get the birthright. Um, reflecting on this story, Lederach speaks of the process and divine accompaniment. He says, quote, As a guiding story, their journey includes and even requires movement away from the conflict, the greatest source of pain, a turning back towards this very source of anxiety, and encounters along the way with oneself, one's enemy, and with God. In the biblical account, Jacob's journey back towards his brother and enemy Esau begins with the voice of God in the night saying, Return to your land. I will be with you. In this story of reconciliation, even God chooses accompaniment over mandates, protection, or leadership. End quote. Seeing the path of saying sorry as a journey means that we do not, as a journey we do not take alone, rather, can help us to say that word to lay the groundwork for reconciliation and actions that reflect this same insanely gracious forgiveness that we find in God ourselves. And our Matthew passage also reminds us that as faith communities, as people gathered here today, the impulse is always for reconciliation and reintegration where possible. We hold people accountable, of course, both of the action itself and the impact, whether intended or not. And yet the faith community, accompanied by God, offers grace and support to both the person seeking forgiveness and the person who is being harmed. But then there's the other tricky phrase that's almost impossible to say, I forgive you. Forgiveness is objectively not an easy thing to accomplish. The fact that Jesus had to go to such lengths to to demonstrate forgiveness, the fact that Paul was writing to the Romans about it, the fact that I'm preaching about it 2,000 years after the fact today, shows that it's a hard phrase to accept and really live out. But it's made easier once again by the presence and the outlook of God, rather than feeling forced to be forgiving all out of our own strength. I want to preface this by saying what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not something that is half-hearted or said but not meant. I'm sure we can think of many times that we said we forgave someone, even when we did fully, just to end the conversation or just to avoid the conflict. And the divine call to forgiveness should also not be used to keep someone in an abusive situation. It is a sad fact that this passage from Matthew about forgiving others has been used to preach that people should stay with abusive partners or not try to hold people accountable for their actions. That interpretation was wrong then, and it's wrong now. But what the parable and teaching of Jesus does tell us about forgiveness is that we are to add compassion and care into the mix. The first servant in the parable is not able to forgive others even though they themselves have received forgiveness. Jesus is teaching us to act with more compassion than that first servant, to trust that the Spirit can move people to be transformed, even if we ourselves cannot be in relationship with that person in the same way that we used to. Forgiveness means trusting and often seeking out support in community, who can then assist in the strength, comfort, and security needed in the process of forgiveness. To forgive means not letting the hurts overwhelm you completely or to shut out God's renewing presence. The psalmist sings that we are no longer trapped in the grave. We can begin to be freed from the hurt when we forgive another in recognizing them as a child of God. It is often not an instantaneous feeling of being free, 
but it's one step on the journey of forgiveness and compassion that God accompanies us through. A journey that God has nurtured countless generations through before, to the point where they could faithfully say, I forgive you. The writer and spiritual director Mark Iaconelli writes in his book, Disappointment, Doubt, and Other Spiritual Gifts, about his encounter visiting a gentleman by the name of Father Vitale, a Franciscan friar and peace activist who had been arrested over 400 times in his advocacy work, and who actually just passed away earlier this month. When visiting Father Vitale in prison, Iaconelli spoke to him, and Vitale taught him about being curious about others about wanting to know more about them and assuming that God was with them on their journeys. This outlook could make the forgiveness and reconciliation work much easier for Vitaly, even as he faced off with people who were doing despicable things. I'm quoting a bit of a longer passage from this book, but I really think that it highlights how if we look at others through this lens, forgiveness is more possible than if we didn't. So Iaconelli writes, In my interview with Vitaly, I watched again and again as he struggled to find something likable in people, some kind of connection that he could feel in his gut that would release a real sense of understanding and empathy for victims as well as perpetrators. This was, in a sense, the essence of Vitaly's spiritual genius. For Vitaly, difficult people stimulated his curiosity. The more different or difficult the person, the more curious he became. Why does this person act this way? What must they have suffered that would cause this behavior? Where is the divine spark in this person? What is beautiful about this person? When Jesus asks us to pray for our enemies, he is inviting this very same curiosity, this very same understanding and empathy. Rather than feeling annoyed or bitter or angry towards people, Vitaly receives people as a blessing, an opportunity to encounter God, to make contact with his own brokenness, an occasion to share the compassion of Jesus. Maybe this blessing comes from receiving others as potential emissaries from God. Maybe it comes from a deep awareness of one's own faults. Maybe it means learning to approach these people who are difficult as opportunities to deepen our compassion for ourselves and for others, and to enjoy the wild diversity of God's love. End quote. In our faith, in our faith community, in the forgiving and transforming presence of God, we are supported in saying those toughest words in the English language sorry and forgiveness. As you go into the week ahead, I would really encourage you to take some time and reflect. Is there someone you need to say sorry to through word and through action? Is there someone that you are feeling called or struggling to forgive? And where can God be of support in that process? How can you lean into God's grace to live in ways of going forward. Be sure to use your actions, your words, your curiosity, and your assurance that we all are the Lord's. Thanks be to God.
take comfort in the words of the psalmist. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord will not always accuse, nor will the Lord keep his anger forever. The Lord does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repays us according to our iniquities. Know God's forgiveness and offer likewise unto others. Amen. We continue with our next hymn found in Voices United, number 299. Teach me God to wonder. Concert. 
Uh, this will be featuring the Seaforth Harmony Kings, which is a barbershop chorus that's uh, becoming very well known and well beloved in the area, as well as some other local talent too. Uh, so this concert will be happening October 15th at 2 o'clock at Melville Presbyterian Church. This is a fundraising concert for both Melville and ourselves. And we're also looking for some volunteers for that concert to help out in the kitchen or hand out bulletins or other various duties as assigned. If you are able to help out, if you could talk to uh, Shirley, that would be greatly appreciated. Can they talk to you, Shirley? I probably should <laughs> confirm that before I say that. <laughs> uh, any other announcements or celebrations to be shared today? Yes, Shirley. Sure. This is coming from Wright Woods Elementary School. These have been really good to support us. Um, the 27th of September, we're having a picnic in the woods. It's featuring Taja Truck. There's two food trucks, one's German food, the other is Mexi Mexican food, but they also have good old Canadian hot dogs and hamburgers and fries. Um, there's a bake sale. Bring your children, grandchildren, grandpas and grandmas, anybody who's in the area. It's from 4 till 7 on the 27th. That's and the money that's raised from that's going to our playground um, purchase which we're looking at about $200,000. So we appreciate your support. Thank you, sure. So again, that's uh, September 27th from 4 to 7. Any other announcements? Do we have an affirming minute for today? Yes, we do. I'm asking you to do a lot today, Shirley. <laughs> Our mission for affirm affirmation today is called Celebrating God's Gift of Diversity. Ministries that choose to become affirming discover that embracing the differences brings blessing and joy to their community. As they declare an explicit openness to otherness, they discover the grace of encouraging encountering the depth and breadth of human diversity. A community that is able to celebrate its diversity is better equipped to solve problems in a collaborative way. It is more able to learn and benefit from the varied experiences and talents of its <clears throat> members. It manages conflict more creatively. It is less judgmental and thus able to embrace a wider perspective of ideas and perspectives. And it is rich, enriched by a great variety of different knowledge, stories, and ways of seeing the world. Affirming ministries discover that when they create space and openness for one facet of human diversity, they create openness for others. In another way of putting it, when we build a wheelchair ramp, it's not just for people who, who are in wheelchairs. It helps parents pushing strollers, volunteers delivering boxes of food for the food bank, and people delivering supplies. Creating openness to difference is a similar ripple, ripple effect, helping many others to feel less judged and more included, such as people struggling with addiction, mental health, or disruptions in their family life. Affirmation is not just for those on the outside. It helps all members to bring their whole and authentic selves to the community.
Continue our prayers in the words so lovingly taught by your risen Son, singing them as found together in Voices United, number 960.
continue with our closing hymn, Voices United 288, Great is Thy name. Thank mm-hmm. you.